Welcome everyone to today's program. I'm Heather Punky, editor of Becker's Infection Control and Clinical Quality. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following completion of the program. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenter will attempt to answer as many questions as he can during this time. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time, but that email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Jim Goche serves as the Senior Clinical Advisor of Infection Prevention to the North American Healthcare Team of Sealed Air Diversity Care. In this role, Jim serves as an infection prevention and control resource and an industry liaison with organizations to assist with the expansion and improvement of environmental hygiene solutions and science-based best practices. Prior to joining Sealed Air in 2015, Jim was an infection control practitioner for 12 years at Providence Care in Kingston, Ontario. Jim has more than 35 years of experience in medical, lab medical laboratory technology and infection prevention. His focus has been across many healthcare areas, including acute, ambulatory, behavioral health, and long-term care. He has played many active roles in consulting and bringing expertise to stakeholders across the infection control spectrum, as well as delivering lectures and training to many institutions and organizations throughout the world. Jim has also been active with Infection Prevention and Control Canada as a member, a board member, and president throughout his career. Jim has been board certified in infection prevention and control since 1990. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Jim to begin today's presentation. Thank you very much, Heather. I appreciate the introduction and welcome everyone. Um, you can see my title slide here about uh, this, and the discussion I want to have today is, do we need to use a sporocidal disinfectant everywhere with the fear and advent of increasing number of cases of Clostridium difficile? So my objectives in this presentation are to review the impact of what we're seeing with Clostridium difficile and look at some of the literature around preventing transmission of Clostridium difficile within our healthcare environment. Um, there's many basic principles that we need to look at around stopping the transmission of any microorganism, and then there's also a time for special practices to be put into place. So I want to discuss that also and look at possible bundled approaches that healthcare facilities can look at before we leap into using a sporocidal disinfectant. So what is our problem bug? Clostridium difficile been around for a while, definitely in my 35 years of healthcare, uh, the organism has been a possible cause and then a known cause of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. It is a spore-forming gram-positive anaerobic bacillus, common, the most common cause of healthcare-associated diarrhea now that we're seeing throughout North America and probably most of the world. It is an opportunistic bacteria, however, and what I mean by that is we definitely need to have a change in our gut microbiome for the organism to cause problems. Just ingesting Clostridium difficile in a vegetative or spore form doesn't precipitate Clostridium difficile infection. You generally have to receive antibiotics or chemotherapeutic agents to upset our normal gut flora to allow the organism to overgrow, produce toxins, and cause the signs and symptoms that unfortunately we are all quite familiar with. So the Spores of Clostridium difficile do have this unique challenge uh, because hand hygiene and disinfection practices may not be what we expect them to do to the organism itself. We know that the spores are resistant to alcohol. As a matter of fact, uh, if you're doing research with Clostridium difficile spores, you actually store the spores in alcohol to preserve them. So we know they are resistant to the effect of that. They're resistant to the effect of natural sunlight, ultraviolet, they're resistant to most commonly used healthcare disinfectants. And several studies have shown that the spores are also difficult to wash off the hand. I'll include some references on the reference slides at the end. But in general, just with hand washing, we're only going to be removing anywhere from one to two log spores from our hands. So this will play into slides down the road here where I talk about glove use for sure in terms of making sure our hands do not become heavily contaminated with Clostridium difficile spores. So we know, and that's what the reason most people are listening in, our Clostridium difficile infection rates are increasing. It does rival MRSA as the most common cause of HAIs, 
and it's moving outside the hospital walls, which is concerning. When we see that 50% of our cases are having onset in the community, and more than 75% of them are having onset outside the acute care hospital. So it's not just an acute care hospital problem. There are many factors that might feed into this. And I have to admit, when I was at Shea this year in 2016, there were numerous posters looking at other things that may make people more susceptible to ha having clostridium difficile actually get through their acid barrier of the stomach and harbor, have patients harbor the organism in their gut, and then if they get exposed to antibiotics, have issues from that. So having clostridium difficile when you actually get into the hospital, it can increase the risk of clostridium difficile to other patients if our cleaning and disinfectant practices aren't up to snuff and several other factors that lead into this. Studies are showing that it is associated with an increased length of stay, it is associated with an increased morbidity and death, and the estimates are up to almost $5 billion in the United States in terms of excess healthcare costs, which is money we cannot afford to spend on this if we can prevent the actual transmission of the spores and organism and stop the movement of it within our healthcare setting. So I'm going to, all of the references that I just talked about came from this article, uh, The Strategies to Prevent Clostridium Difficile Infections in Acute Care Hospitals, a 2014 update. This document published in ITCHE is a collaborative document that had input from SHEA, the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. It had input from the Infectious Disease Society of America, APIC, our Association for Practitioners in Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology, the American Hospital Association, and the Joint Commission were all partners in getting this document to the point that it's at now in 2014. And it is an update of the 20, 2008 document that was also published in SHEA. So in this document, they discuss several factors around the whole uh, milieu of problems that happen with um, Clostridium difficile. So one of the big things is to recognize that antimicrobial uses and restriction is a great strategy to help prevent Clostridium difficile infection. And they recommend um, restriction of high, specific high-risk antimicrobials has been a, a effective in some outbreak settings. I know in Britain there were several papers where they limited use of fluoroquinolones within their healthcare settings. Antibiotics such as clindamycin, or sorry, uh, ciprofloxacin, and they saw a good reduction in the Clostridium difficile infections that were occurring uh, because that antibiotic and the rest of the fluoroquinolones were being used for sort of a shotgun approach of different bacterial infections. If we also improve our antimicrobial prescribing practices, part of having a good stewardship program is to make sure that we have the right drug for the right indication in the right route for the right length of time. And having all those factors in place help limit antibiotics Definitely, if they're being used as a empiric treatment, you get culture results back that show that it's either a different pathogen, a more sensitive pathogen. You need to have an awareness around this. This presentation isn't going to talk about antibiotic stewardship any more than that, but it's a very interesting component of stopping some healthcare-associated infections. Another general strategy list to prevent clostridium difficile infection that were present in the collaborative paper are to avoid the use of electronic thermometers. Now, when I read further into that, that's around the difficulty with decontaminating the handle of the thermometer. So that made me wonder a little bit, is this also then applicable to things such as blood glucose monitors that will go from room to room to room and may also become contaminated through use with our patients? Having dedicated patient care items and equipment is the ideal situation for any patient, uh, but we all recognize with budgetary restraints that's not possible either. Definitely to have use of contact precautions and making sure that private rooms, if possible, are used for those precautions. Definitely if you don't have choice of having a private room, give preference to those patients with fecal incontinence. If you have someone with clostridium difficile infection that is producing diarrhea but they're continent, they're able to use the toilet, they're able to look after their own peri care, they're probably not transmitting as many organisms into the environment than someone who is incontinent within their bed or incontinent and requiring continence assistance such as a brief. Hand hygiene is always vitally important, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Environmental cleaning and disinfection. And in the document, they do recommend a sporocidal if you are in an outbreak or a hyperendemic situation. And again, I'm going to be addressing this in a few slides. 
We also definitely need to have good staff, patient, and visitor education. And to me, not just around Clostridium difficile, but to have education on all modes of transmission of all microorganisms and the importance of our staff in preventing the transmission, the patient and visitors. So we do know that patient-to-patient -patient transmission of C. difficile is primarily through transient contamination of the hands of healthcare personnel. So the spores get into the environment, they get moved by healthcare worker hands or gloves, and then someone, another patient can come into contact with those spores or organisms, ingest them, have them harbored in their gut, receive antibiotics, and develop the disease. Definitely having glove use when caring for patients with Clostridium difficile or touching any surfaces in the room has been very effective in preventing transmission, but I personally am not a strong believer in universal gloving. Universal gloving is the concept where you put a pair of gloves on to enter the patient's space. My problem with that is we then tend to contaminate more of the environment because staff then are hesitant to change their gloves. And if they do come in contact with, say, a bed rail that unfortunately has some feces on it microscopically, and then touch a curtain, a privacy curtain around a patient without changing the gloves in between as we would sanitize our hands, I think this can lead in some cases to further problems. It's also vitally important that we have gloves on if there's any potential contact with feces at all. I think this will help limit the spread of many organisms that are harbored in feces. So don't just think of Clostridium difficile when I say feces. We need to think of organisms such as MRSA, VRE, ESBL-containing organisms, and carbapenemase-producing organisms also. These are all harbored in the feces, sometimes in huge quantities. So generally speaking, all feces is bad is the best way that I can put it. And if there's any potential contact with feces that our healthcare staff are going to have, we need to have gloves on, again, as I spoke earlier, to reduce the number of bacteria that may be on our hands. It's not the be all and end all to stop transmission, but I think it's vitally important for our staff to be aware of that and to make sure that gloves are removed appropriately, carefully, and that hand hygiene is then performed after. So we don't do know that daily disinfection of high-touch surfaces it has been shown to reduce the acquisition of pathogens or on hands after contact with surfaces. There's been many good studies of this that we know that if you go into a room that has Clostridium difficile spores in it and touch a surface, you're going to pick up C. difficile spores in your hands. We've got papers that show that, but we also have papers to show that just daily disinfection and good cleaning of our high-touch surfaces can help reduce the amount of stuff that's picked up. And by high touch surfaces, I'm referring to our bed rails, chairs and furniture, the overbed tables, bedside tables and phones, as a small number of the things that are here. The call bell many times is also forgotten, unfortunately, as a high touch surface. So the issue of sharing a room with a patient who has been diagnosed with Clostridium difficile, there's a risk there of having your neighbor who is incontinent of you acquiring C. difficile because the environment will get contaminated. It's a little more controversial about going into a room after a patient who has had C. difficile and they've been discharged from that room, whether or not you have a higher risk. The literature is a little bit split on this, uh, back and forth through the studies that are listed in the collaborative document that I referenced at the start. Um, I think it weighs one in favor and three not in favor of an increased risk from it. And there's some discussion as to even the one paper where there was an increased risk, whether that was actually seen or not, depending on how you look at the actual numbers. We know that using sporocidal to clean the environment outside of outbreak settings has not been consistently demonstrated for a reduction in CDI. And I've got some interesting uh, literature coming up here in a few slides that also looks at what happens with the introduction of routine use of sporocidal agents. So we need to also be aware of that as I progress through this presentation. So as stated, we know C. difficile spores contaminate the environment. Um, one of the other things that happens with Clostridium difficile is if a patient passes a vegetative bacteria, meaning there's no spore present, just as being exposed to the external environment is harsh on a strict anaerobe like Clostridium difficile or any of the Clostridial species. So the organisms can sporulate in the environment once they're passed and have oxygen around them because that's harsh. If we're using disinfectant uh, diluters that are way out of control and way over diluting, there's some studies that suggest that may make the organism sporulate quicker. So as a side note, we need to make sure that if you're using a concentrated disinfectant and diluting it, that your diluters are working appropriately. So we need to make sure also that as we 
work through our environment, um, we've got to also remember things like thermometers, stethoscopes, and blood pressure cuffs that go into the room do need to be disinfected. Do they need to be done with a sporicidal agent? Let's take a look at some of the literature further on here in this presentation. So the collaborative document looks at basic practices that should be done. And this is our routine practices, stuff that we need to do with every single patient in every single hospital that uh, I'm reaching through this presentation. It's got to be done um, where the potential to reduce the impact of an HAI risk outweighs the potential for any kind of an undesirable side effect. And we'll talk about that further here with some of the um, slides I've got coming up. Special approaches, when you're into a situation where your basic practices are not working properly, then you need to consider moving to a sporicidal agent, even though there is an increased risk of undesirable outcomes. So this is, has to be weighed off. You need to check your basic practices first and then consider moving into using special approaches. So let's take a look at a pictogram here of your typical hospital situation. When I talk task-oriented use of a sporicidal agent, I'm talking about using a sporicidal agent in a patient's room that we know has clostridium difficile and is actually soiling the environment. As I said earlier, the risk, if you have a continent patient that can actually get to the toilet, uh, do their own peri care, uh, there is no visible soiling of the environment with feces, I would question whether we need to have the actual sporicidal agent used in there. I would probably do it if we know the patient has C. difficile because there's lots of papers to show that our hospital toilets do create a bit of a plume when we flush them. And I'm hoping down the road we're actually going to start seeing lids on our toilet seats within our healthcare setting. But if we have one patient on the right-hand side of this diagram here with a clostridium difficile infection, why are we going to use it everywhere um, through all the different patient rooms, nurses station, the intensive care unit, neonatal areas, when we only have the one patient? So I want to look at some of the factors that can feed into this. So the document, the collaborative document talks about, before you get to the special procedures, let's look at how well our cleaning and disinfection is actually happening. And if you assess the adequacy of that, and find that it's lacking, you need to fix that before you consider moving to a new cleaning product, such as sodium hypochlorite. If they're not adequate, fix that. Um, so this is where we're actually gonna have to start making sure that our EBS staff, and I'm gonna be talking about this again, our EBS staff are well-trained, that we use some sort of a system of auditing it. We need to make sure that our patient care equipment and electronic equipment are being cleaned and disinfected, and that everyone has been trained well on what they're responsible for. So do you have high rates of healthcare-associated infections? And I'm not just talking, talking on clostridium difficile. We, when we look at the basic practices, there's several things that we need to keep in mind. So this is a chart taken from a paper by Dr. Rutala in 2014. The paper was actually um, titled The Ideal Disinfectant uh, Characteristics That You Would Look For. And in the paper, there was this table. And what I find interesting about this table is we look at the organisms that cause the highest number of healthcare-associated infections, excluding Clostridium difficile. We can look at this table from Staph aureus and E. coli, and that would include MRSA. It would include resistant Escherichia coli also. They cause almost a quarter of our healthcare-associated infections, and these are actually rather easy organisms to kill with most disinfectants that we use within the healthcare setting. So we even look at the top five which cause 50% of our illnesses that we see in health, related to healthcare-associated infections. We've got Staph aureus again in E. coli, we've got a coagulase negative Staphylococci, Klebsiella organisms, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, make up over half. So what I'm trying to set in your mind here is if you're seeing other healthcare-associated infections within your healthcare setting caused by MRSA, CRE, um, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, be they resistant or not resistant, but if you're seeing these organisms causing healthcare-associated infections, this is the first indicator. You've got something wrong with your basic practices, and you don't need to move to a sporicidal agent because you also have Clostridium difficile. You need to address the basic problems that you're facing with our easy-to-kill organisms. And this document here, all of these organisms, if you take out yeast that are listed on this slide, cause almost 80% of the infections that we're seeing within healthcare today. So with any of these things are your problem, and with the enterococcus listed on here, if you're seeing ongoing transmission of BRE, there's no point in leaping into a, a sporicidal agent in all rooms until you address the cleaning problems that you must have because your regular disinfectants 
which is highly effective against the vast majority of these organisms, obviously isn't working. So I like to use this gradient of what is hard to kill versus what is easy to kill. And again, this is adapted from the same article that Dr. Rutella did on the idea of disinfectants. And this has numerous inputs from uh, many different articles. If you go to the actual reference, um, Dr. Rutella took this from numerous different publications looking at how hard it is to kill stuff. So on this graph here, you can see that the easiest thing to kill is our bloodborne pathogens, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, influenza. And then your gram-positive bacteria are a little harder to kill. Your large non-envelope viruses, such as adenovirus and rotavirus, are harder to kill. Uh, candida in a vegetative state is actually easier to kill than some of the gram-negative organisms, such as E. coli and Klebsiella. When we talk about our fungal spores that would be produced by organisms such as Aspergillus or Trichophyton, our good old athlete foot bugs, um, they're a little harder to kill than our gram-negative bacteria. But we're also looking at when you get into things like if you've got norovirus outbreaks that are occurring regularly, that's a very difficult small virus to kill. Uh, and it also gives us a good idea of the efficacy of our disinfectant against the non-envelope viruses. If it just has a virucidal claim, you want to make sure that it's been tested against norovirus or a surrogate of norovirus because we can't actually check that. Our tuberculocidal claims here with mycobacteria and then the bacterial spore. We know that is the hardest to kill. So I think what I was trying to get to with the previous graph, and I've stated this already, is if you're seeing ongoing problems with MRSA, theory, theory, you've got something going on with your cleaning and disinfection practices. If you're not seeing any problems with that and you've still got an issue with Clostridium difficile, you're in a hyperendemic mode, and that's when we may need to look at going to a sporocidal agent. So we've also, in, within sealed air, we've developed this um, risk of soiling. And uh, this is sort of a, a work in progress ourselves. Um, we were quite happy with this. We ran a little focus group at APIC this year in 2016 and discussed this with some of the IPs that came and talked to us. If I come into a patient's room to just do phlebotomy, I'm not going to risk soiling the room too much unless my tray is particularly dirty. So do I really need to clean anything in the room after that? At the top of it, if I'm doing anything that involves feces within a patient's setting, I need to be aware that I've probably soiled something, unless I'm an absolute magician at changing a dirty brief. Something is going to get touched, feces will get into the environment or onto my patient's hands. To me, that's probably the highest risk of soiling the environment. And with doing these kind of procedures or assisting a vomiting patient or doing a bed pass, there's probably stuff within the patient environment that needs to be disinfected shortly after this procedure not the next day when EVS comes in to do their once a day cleaning, maybe twice a day cleaning if some hospitals do that for Clostridium difficile or some of the other resistant organisms like VRE. Uh, so this gradient helps me judge and could also help our nursing staff judge how much soiling is happening within the room. Because if they have an incontinent patient that requires regular opening suctioning and has several large rooms that need dressing, they're at risk of sowing in the environment with a large number of organisms. So stay tuned. Um, I'm going to come back to this slide probably in our, my next Becker's webinar, uh, webinar in the fall. So some of the other factors we need to look at around our basic practices are where are we at with our hand hygiene? Does everyone understand the importance of it? We have been talking to our staff big time since WHO came out with the five moments of hand hygiene in approximately 2008. So our staff are well versed in it. Visitors and patients, I think are starting to catch on to the issue around it. They may understand it, but do they really know when they have to perform hand hygiene? I don't have references listed here, but I know um, there's been papers published on the patient's moments for hand hygiene uh, that I found very interesting to look at that there's certain times our patients really should sanitize or wash their hands. But can they? If our patient is mobility impaired, they've got a fractured hip and they're in bed, but they're totally with it, there's no way for them to get out of bed and wash their hands. Do we provide hand sanitizer at point of care for our patients to actually sanitize their hands? And if we do provide sanitizer in pre-sealed pouches or in some form of a pump bottle, are they capable of performing it and do they understand that it's theirs to use? I received a very interesting letter from a patient who was well into her 80s and she had VRV. So I had gone to talk to her on admission, explained to her what the VRE was, why we're having gowns on in the room, what she had to do when she went home. She sent me a lovely one-page letter, um, trying not to be presumptuous, 
uh, but she wanted to share some of the facts with me of what she observed. One of them was, I should have told her that that pump bottle of alcohol on her overbed table was for her to use. She thought it was just for the staff. So just providing it without education to the patient as to when and how to use it is a very, very important step that we have to have around our hand hygiene. Watching the technique is also important. There's been some very good studies recently in posters at Shea and APIC on proper technique for washing and proper technique for rubbing and making sure that we are doing a good job of it and auditing it or checking that our staff are doing it. For me, the simplest was using uh, red finger paint, have our staff put on a pair of gloves, add some finger paint, say, this is soap, show me how you wash your hands, don't look at what you're doing, and see where they missed the glove. And that shows them where they didn't have the mechanical action. Can we do that with their patients on admission? I think it would be a great idea. Or literally, on admission, give them some sanitizer, watch them rub it in, touch it up a little bit. We know we've got a well-educated patient. If they can't rub it in on this kind of an assessment, maybe we need a sign that says help needed or help required with hand hygiene, something to that effect to remind staff that are having interactions with the patient that they may need to assist them with their hand hygiene. So is environmental cleaning or disinfection your issue? I've talked about how to recognize that this may be an issue if you're seeing ongoing transmission of the easy to kill, but do we also have a good understanding of our staff's role in keeping the environment clean and disinfected? Is it clearly defined who is responsible for this? This chart here is we developed to show or use as an audit of who is doing what. And I think if any infection preventionist took this up to their nursing unit, handed it to the nurse and say, okay, check off what you're responsible for and let me know how frequently you do it, you might get a deer in the headlight look from them. If you go and sit down with your EVS staff, you may find out that some of this stuff they will never touch because they assume it's electronic, it's the nurse's job, or they're just scared to get too close to the patient with their disinfectant. I think this is a very good chart to take and also find out if there's other people doing cleaning and disinfection that your nursing or EBS staff may not be aware of, or if there's a piece of equipment not being done, it may need to be assigned to someone else to actually do the cleaning or disinfection. So we have to look at what needs to be cleaned, what you're using, and something that I've been talking about since I've joined Sealed Air is we need to be very aware of our quat finding issue. If any of you listening to this are using a quaternary based disinfectant, you have to check to make sure that your cleaning tools are not finding the quat. So talk to your manufacturer about getting a test strip to check the quat Prepare the quad as indicated. So if it's coming out of a diluting station, have it come into your bucket, check it to make sure it's at the right dilution with the color strip, stick your cleaning cloth into it, take the cloth out, wring it out on a surface and touch a new stick to test the quantity of quad that's released. Um, on a website that I'll be sharing at the end of the presentation, you can see a very scary demonstration where there is absolutely no quad released from the cloth in that quick of a transaction. Dipping it in, wringing it out and touching it. And this doesn't just apply, we know it happens all the time with cotton cloths. So if you're using old pieces of face cloth or cotton towels as a cleaning rag and you're using a quat, you're basically rubbing surfaces with water. But there's now several papers, especially one that was published very early this spring by Dr. John Boyce, where their microfiber cloths and disposable cloths that were coming out of a dry container were binding quats. Uh, so it's very, very important for us to check this making sure also that our dilution is actually working because in Dr. Boyce's study, all of his diluters were erroneous in their dilution. Some had nothing in it, some weren't working, and every other one diluted slightly less and it was all due to a water pressure problem. So this is something that we need to look at around our cleaning and disinfection. Do we have the product available? If you have a nurse that does soil the environment from that chart that I showed you with changing a patient out of a brief and they have to wander any distance at all to find a disinfectant, chances are they're going to get interrupted. It's not their fault. They're very, very busy people. And if the disinfectant isn't right where that care is happening, chances are the surface will not get wiped if the nurse gets interrupted. It's not a malicious act at all. It's just a fact of what we face nowadays that we are all so busy within our healthcare setting. We also need to document and take a good look at it. Is the product being used properly? Do we, if we require PPE, is that being used or are we going to have the occupational safety people in talking to us about why personal protective equipment wasn't provided or isn't available? Are we achieving the contact time? If we have a 10-minute label claim 
for the easy to kill stuff which some of our quads have, you need to make sure that you're achieving that 10 minute label claim. If it's a five minute, three minute, many times surfaces won't stay wet for that length of time. If your product has an alcohol base to it or some sort of a solvent as a disposable wipe, you need to be very aware of the drying time of these things. I was also very excited to run into an EBS manager that shared with me that she got to go to new employee orientation every month and talk for 45 minutes about EBS staff, what they do, and she then trained all new staff on how to clean and disinfect appropriately for their job description and how to use disposable wipes properly. I was blown away by this. Um, I actually asked her and her team to present a poster and they did this, uh, this year, 2016, at the Infection Prevention and Control Canada conference that was held in Niagara Falls. Uh, so that poster went up and I'm hoping that they actually publish this as a small article to thrill and excite those of us that could never imagine having 45 minutes to talk to new staff about how to clean and disinfect the environment. As a side note, she also pointed out they didn't seem to have much of a problem with MRSA in their facility, so I think it was working well. So I talked earlier about we needing to assess the adequacy of our room cleaning. Um, if it's inadequate, if we use um, something like ATP or culture or fluorescent markers, we need to make sure that the surfaces are being wiped the way that we think they are being done. If they're not being done properly, find out what the issue was. When we introduced fluorescent markers in the facility that I left, I said to my EBS staff, this is not to show you're doing the job poorly. I want to use this to show you're doing a great job. And if a spot's been missed, we work together to find out what the issue was. And my EBS staff bought into this wholeheartedly. Uh, because they wanted to be the best EBS staff up on the floor. And I had an EBS uh, worker say to me, I remember why I missed that. This happened and this happened, and now I know that I've got to make sure I do this and this and this. Having that unit-specific check checklist of who's cleaning what and auditing that. If your nurses are assigned the responsibility for cleaning something, say an ultrasound machine with the bladder scanner on it, that's their responsibility, that should be checked to make sure that it's being done. And we used to mark those with our fluorescent marker also to make sure that these pieces of equipment were also being cleaned appropriately. Now this again is from the collaborative documents. So they do say, consider environmental decontamination with sodium hypochlorite or another sporocidal agent if your room cleaning and disinfection is deemed to be adequate, but you're still seeing ongoing clostridium difficile infection transmission. Uh, so it's getting back to the basics, making sure that our basic functions of EBS and our nursing staff and other people responsible for cleaning and disinfection are doing what we think they are doing and then if we're still seeing ongoing transmission and our hand hygiene compliance is great and our patients are able to do their hands within their bed space and our visitors aren't going from bed to bed to bed, then we may need to look at using a sporocidal agent. Now we know there's many studies out there and this one is just one of the many. Uh, Dr. Carling did this study looking at how many high touch surfaces were not being cleaned thoroughly and it varied between zero and 90% depending on the surface. Um, this was one of the first papers to call to attention. We need to audit how well our EBS staff are doing, and this is the introduction of using a fluorescent marker to get that compliance much higher. There are issues and concerns around using sporocidal agents. First of all, the data is conflicting. As stated in the collaborative document, we know the agents can be harsh on surfaces. Uh, there's going to be some discoloration, especially if you're using sodium hypochlorite on surfaces that are prone to being bleached out. It will shorten the life cycle of some of our assets. There's going to be oxidation and wear. I remember doing a presentation to a bunch of dentists on infection control in the dental office, talking about routine disinfection of the environment around the operatory and the patients. And one of the dentists came up to me and said, we tried that and it ruined everything in our operatory that the patient was receiving their dental care. And I said, well, where do you buy your equipment from? And it was office supplies that they were using. It's not stuff that was made to be disinfected the way we now know it has to be. So it wasn't the fault of the vinyl that was used on the chair that the patient sat in. It wasn't a real good quality that could be disinfected the way we know it now has to be. We also have to recommend that sporocidal agents can be very harsh on people. Um, uh, we know that several of the pr uh, products that are used as sporocidal agents do precipitate or make people sensitive to them and leading to asthma. Some of them have a very foul odor to them. They can be irritating to lungs, skin, and eyes. And there was a recent MMWR article that was looking at one of the sporocidal agents and issues reported to them by staff. And they were bringing to the attention that we need a little bit better idea of what is being used, the frequency of it being used, and where it's being used. 
because it is affecting some staff in some facilities. In Shea 2016, uh, there was this poster presentation that was done, the references at the bottom, and I'm really hoping that this does get published soon. Because what they were doing was introducing a sporocidal agent to be used. Uh, and they brought in their change management team. And they had a wonderful plan in place where they had their stakeholder meetings, they provided tons of education, they changed their cleaning carts, and they had checklists in place to make sure surfaces were being done. They made sure that the daily duties were well described as to who was doing what, and they switched to using a sporocidal agent for daily cleaning. So in the graph on the right-hand side, and I'm not sure if my mouse is going to work or advance here. Let me just try to get my mouse to work. So we've got here, before the intervention, are the tall bars. So the bed rails are being cleaned 64% of the time. And after the intervention, only 12% of the time. About equal for the bedside table. The IV pump dropped a little bit. And overall, cleaning compliance went from 49%, sorry, to 35% when they introduced the sporocidal agent. And on the different units, the cleaning efficacy dropped on all units except for the medical intensive care unit. And where the red arrow is here, one of their conclusions was the new sporocidal daily cleaning solution, which may have a strong and irritating, which have a strong and irritating odor, might be playing a major role in this decrease. That's their assumption around it. So it's something that we have to be aware of. If again, we've got all of our basic practices in place and we introduce sporocidal agent because of ongoing transmission, we then also have to audit and make sure that everything is still being wiped as effectively as we would like to see. So I stated this already that we have sort of conflicting results about introducing sporocidal agent. I know some facilities have been very successful at controlling the facility and difficile. Um, and I'm not sure if that's the introduction of a sporocidal agent or if it was the induction, introduction of a sporocidal agent and better education for everyone, getting back to the basic principle. If you're going to introduce it, and this comes from our collaborative document, you have to be very careful about the toxicity to patients and staff and damage. Um, we know it's going to be irritating to some people. We have to definitely coordinate activities with EBS and infection prevention to make sure that everyone knows how, when, where, what we're using. So I want to look at some alternative options. So there's a paper that Dr. Brutella did in 2012 um, that was just looking at what happens when we just wipe the surface with Clostridium difficile spores. And in this paper, they showed that just wiping a surface with a wet cloth can reduce the number of C. difficile spores by almost three loss. And adding a wetting agent that is a sporocidal agent to it did increase the efficacy from just the wipe to 3.9 logs. The paper did show that if you left the sporocidal agent in place for the required contact time, it did what it was supposed to do. Uh, but it was very interesting that any method that includes wiping the surface, physical removal, uh, resulted in almost a three log reduction, even if the product is not a sporocidal agent. There's another paper uh, that I referenced here by Dr. Alpha uh, that looked at an alternate to using bleach in all of their toilets or using bleach throughout their facility uh, when they were worried about Clostridium difficile in non-outbreak situations. So what they did is they used an enhanced, sorry, an improved hydrogen peroxide product. Um, they introduced it at the 0.5% and tested it to see what it actually uh, would do within a laboratory setting. So within the lab, and when they actually used it within toilets and did contact sites before and after, they showed that the, at a 0.5% concentration, they were seeing a two to three log kill after one minute. And this was with no wiping. Uh, so the toilets were being sprayed down and tested to see what was happening. Adding a wiping step to it did show a bit more removal um, as stated in the previous paper. Um, but they summarized that you know, they were seeing a, a reduction in the number of spores that were actually present. And they were a little happier with the improved hydrogen peroxide formulation in terms of the other workplace safety concerns that they were experiencing by using a 5,000 parts per million bleach. So I think we have to recognize that just using a disinfectant isn't the entire solution is what we're looking here. We need the integrated approach of having the right product, definitely making sure that our procedures are very well defined with good education of our staff, and having good validation that all of this is happening. So another study that Dr. Alpha did after looking at the improved hydrogen peroxide was introducing it into her facility. So what she did was changed out their cleaning agent that they were using, which probably was part of the issue that they were seeing originally, but they switched to, again, a 0.5% improved hydrogen peroxide and showed that by using it 
maintaining bleach in their known C. difficile room, but by introducing the improved hydrogen peroxide, they showed a reduction of their VRE, their C. difficile, and their MRSA by 20%. And they, they concluded in the paper the cost avoidance was upwards of $670,000 a year because of this decrease in 20% by the rates across the board. Part of their study also showed that you need to have very clear protocol and compliance monitoring because when they started the study, they were a little shocked to find out that their compliance was 30 to 40 percent, and then they increased it a little bit. So they got it up to the 80 percent to make sure that things were uh, being cleaned properly. There's a second study that looked at improved hydrogen peroxide that was just presented at uh, 2016 with APIC. Uh, Dr. John Boyce did a, a poster presentation, and what their study design was, was looking over a 12-month period, they had two campuses, two wards on each campus, and they randomized them to having housekeepers perform their daily cleaning and disinfection with either the improved hydrogen peroxide, 0.5%, or using the quad disinfectant that was being used um, in regularly within the hospital. Uh, and this is back to his study to find out that they're having a little bit of issue with their quad dilutions. They got that all fixed. They used a disposable wipe for both products. Um, the IHP actually came pre-wetted and the quad was added to um, the melchrome polypropylene so that the same wipe was being used and they could eliminate that as a factor. The two sites, they had a medical intensive care unit and a step down on the one campus, two general medical wards on the other campus, and after six months, they switched what was happening. Now this study looked at many outcome factors uh, in their paper. So they were actually doing cultures. So their aerobic colony count, just looking at how many bacteria were on a surface after cleaning, on the IHP wards was 14 on average, and on the quad wards was 22. Uh, so that was a statistically significant reduction in the number of organisms actually present on the surface using an aerobic colony count. And then looking at the data further and digging down, they looked at the number of surfaces that actually yielded no growth after cleaning. And again, this was statistically significant for using the improved hydrogen peroxide versus the quad on the floor. Um, so both of their factors favored the IHP over using a quad. Some of the other interesting stuff that they discovered is they saw a reduction in their VRE acquisition and bloodstream infection. They saw a reduction in their MRSA and bloodstream infection. They saw a reduction in their C. difficile infection for a composite outcome of 23 fewer cases per 1,000 patient days on the hydrogen peroxide ward. And some of the other stuff that they looked at that I found was very, very interesting is they ruled out hand hygiene compliance because they found that to be comparable on both study areas, uh, consistent throughout the actual study that they did. One of the interesting things when this was presented is the antibiotic usage. So non-C. difficile agent use was actually higher on the IHP ward, yet the reduction of infections was evident in the statistics. So if you start using more antibiotics on a floor, generally speaking, I would expect to see more VRE, MRSA, and CDF outcomes, but that was not observed. Uh, so again, through effective products, good cleaning technique, because they were also auditing their EBS staff to make sure that it was being cleaned properly, we can show a reduction in using something without a true sporocidal label claim. So that's my summary slide there. Good product, good procedures, and validation can reduce HAI infections, including Clostridium difficile. And this gets back to our basics. Before we leap into using sporocyte top to bottom, make sure our basics are present. So that's the uh, learning. Part of the, probably one of the learnings I need everyone to take away with is that you need to have a good process, procedure, and training in place, um, making sure that we can measure compliance with all of this. And obviously, there is no good substitute for hand hygiene, but not just for our staff. I think we need to audit, and I've seen some current papers out there about auditing patient hand hygiene. Some of the early papers are rather pathetic, where it just wasn't being done. And even with education, in many cases, it's not being done. I, need that. I think that's another good focus for us on helping stop the transmission of Clostridium difficile. So in summary, our healthcare setting with a patient with Clostridium difficile located in one area, I think can be controlled through good task-oriented use of a sporocidal agent. There's a list here of reasons, again, summarizing my presentation, that you don't need to use it everywhere, every day. It can be hard on everyone, it can be corrosive to our environment, and with some of the information I presented here, I don't think it's truly necessary if you have good basic practices in place for your day-to-day -day cleaning and disinfection. 
I also like to look at um, a healthcare associated infection as being like an algebraic equation uh, because there's so many factors to tie into this and it's not just one thing. We're not going to stop HAI by switching to a sporocidal agent, period. Um, there's many factors here. So I, I do it as an equation that you know, a healthcare associated infection prevention is going to be a combination of hand hygiene with all of the many factors that I've talked about involved with that, a good antibiotic stewardship program in place, making sure that we've got the right drug, the right dose, the right place, the right time, for the right organism, um, having good clinical practices in place, which I truly haven't talked about in any detail, but by having bundles in place, we know we can reduce our central line associated infections. We know by having checklists, we can prevent some surgical site infections. By making sure that our antibiotics are on, are on board before an incision at the right time and well documented, we know we can prevent infections. Our fecal waste management, I didn't talk on in great detail here other than anything to do with feces in a patient's space, but there's so many factors involved with this and all of the numerous factors that can play into our environmental disinfection. I'm hoping to use this as the core for my presentation, uh, my next Becker's uh, presentation that I'll be doing in the fall, to look at how all of these factors feed into a healthcare associated infection. And we can't just get focused on our staff hand hygiene, our EVS staff doing a good job, and using a sporocidal agent. Um, as I work through this presentation on uh, healthcare associated infection math, I think I'm up to approximately 42 factors that can feed into this that we need to take a good look at and have all in place to make sure that our healthcare associated infection rate is as low as possible. So I see that I've still got a few minutes left to take some questions. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and Heather, if there's any questions, I'm willing to take some now. Great. Thank you, Jim, for that informative and enjoyable presentation. As you mentioned, we will now begin the Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder to our audience, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Jim will attempt to answer as many questions as we can during the time we have left for today's webinar. The first question for Jim is, what is the policy of most medical centers of CDI patients walking outside their room? I think this is a case-by-case -case basis. We allowed C. difficile patients out of our rooms if they were not leaking. And I think if people get their head wrapped around any patient who is leaking should not be leaving the room. And I tried to do a acronym void talk when I discussed this with IPs. I don't focus on CDI and CRE and MRSA and VRE. I focus on basic patient activity. Are they leaking? And by leaking, do I mean, do they have loose stool that's not being seen by a brief? Do they have loose stool that's catching them short and they're sort in the environment? Do they have a productive cough and they're producing sputum that they can't control? Do they have a trach, for instance, and they're sorting the environment with sputa? Do they have a runny nose and a fever? They shouldn't be out of the room because they're soiling the environment. Do they have an open wound or a wound that the dressing is being changed on an hourly basis because the amount of fluid that's being leaking from this patient? None of those patients should be freely roaming around our hallways. They're soiling the environment. So if my Clostridium difficile infected patient is continent, compliant with hand hygiene, I personally have no problem with that patient moving through the hallway. There is an education component to this. There's an audit component required with this also in terms of checking this. But all of our nursing staff do an assessment on their patient every shift. They come in and find out what's going on with the patient. And I always discuss this as part of my ongoing infection prevention and control education with any nurses that I talk to. Forget the acronym, assess your patient. If they're soiling the environment, you've got to limit their movement and protect yourself. And to me, that is standard precautions in a nutshell. If the patient or they, actually I use it generically, if they are leaking, Protect yourself and limit their movement. If it's dirty or you've used it, clean it. Standard precautions in a nutshell. Uh, and I have yet to find a situation that doesn't fall into that. Um, so even if you've got a coworker that's coughing, hacking, sneezing, and snorting, they're leaking. Limit their movement. Send them home. Protect yourself. Keep your social distancing of a couple of yards away from them. Um, it applies to almost any situation at all, and especially the statement, if it's dirty or you've used it, clean it. So if you've used your hand within a healthcare environment, you've got to clean them. Um, if it's dirty and you don't know who's going to clean it, you've got to clean it. 
Um, if it's a tub that you bathe the patient in, someone has to be tasked with making sure that that is clean. Um, so I've always tried to stay away from the clostridium difficile patient, the patient with CRV. I would rather refer to the patient or staff member and try to keep it that simple. Great, that makes sense. Thank you, Jim. The next question is, how do you clean your hands if sanitizer sanitizers don't work on C. diff before you leave the isolation room and you don't have an anteroom adjoining the room? This is always an issue, and it's discussed everywhere I read, especially on the IP talk at the APIC site. My statement earlier in the presentation was anything we do with feces, we should have gloves on. Um, and removing the glove is going to remove the substantial load of organisms that are going to be present by coming in contact with feces. If we have an incontinent patient, a patient who's still in the environment with feces, regardless of what's causing them to have loose stool, should be on contact precautions. And that sign means you are going to put on protective equipment to enter the patient's space. You will have protective equipment onto contact surfaces within the room. So if you come out of the patient room and appropriately remove your protective equipment after having been exposed to feces within the patient's environment, you really shouldn't have a high log number of organisms on your hands. And in my facilities, if your hands were not visibly soiled, we were quite happy with their staff coming out of C. difficile rooms and using a hand sanitizer if they had used the protective equipment appropriately. Now, if you haven't used the protective equipment appropriately, and you've been soiled with feces, or you were caught unaware that the patient was going to be incontinent and your hands were visibly soiled, you then do need to wash your hands. The concerns around that, and we also have numerous asymptomatic patients that we'll be carrying, which is pretty difficult, are the studies that I'm going to add to the presentation here uh, that show that having C. difficile spores in your hands, you're only going to affect around a two log reduction in those spores by washing. Now, feces itself contains trillions of organisms. And I'm not even sure the actual log number of spores that could be present in feces in a patient that is um, active with the C. difficile. Our hand of washing needs to be much more effective, especially based on these studies where they generally did anywhere from a 50, sorry, a 15 to 30 second lathering and a rinse that varied between 5 to 15 seconds. They weren't showing a great log reduction. So I think we need to be much more focused on if we are visibly soiled with feces, we need to do a really, really, really good wiping off of that material, probably with a paper towel first, without contaminating anything, getting our hands well washed. I personally, when I used to get exposed to feces from my dog, not from humans, would wash my hands very well and personally follow it up with alcohol-based hand rub. That's very hard on your skin. I don't recommend that all the time because you've removed your protective oil. So it's, uh, I know some hospitals, when they have a spritting difficult infection room, remove the hand sanitizer. I think this can be an issue if you do not have readily available, dedicated hand hygiene sinks for the staff to use. If you remove your hand sanitizer, because the patient has clostridium difficile infection, and the staff need to wash their hands within the patient's washroom or using a sink that the patient may have bathed themselves in, you stand a good potential for recontaminating hands, in my humble opinion. Great. Thank you, Jim. The next question from our audience is, some companies clean C. diff discharges twice, first with a low-level disinfectant with good cleaning capabilities to remove or Organic bio burden. Then with a sporicidal bleach based oh, I'm sorry. Then with a sporicidal bleach based product to kill any remaining spores. Is that a good practice in your opinion? It depends on your basic practices. I think if you're auditing your EBS staff on all room clean and you've got good compliance with the pickup or with measurement with ATP or the pickup of the fluorescent um, that you're using or even um, in some cases, people would do culturing before the patient's readmitted to the room. I'm not sure of the necessity of the second step. Um, if you've got uh, poor EDS compliance with their basic cleaning, then yes, you may have to look at doing something like that. But I think if we step back and look at it, um, especially if we go back and look at the voice study, where they just did really, really good cleaning and showed a hospital-wide reduction of 20% um, of extruding difficile, I think that shows that if you've got good cleaning, and disinfection and auditing it, you can reduce this around. I've always questioned uh, when this first came out in the literature, and I've seen this throughout both Canada and the United States of the double clean. Uh, 
Uh, and I think this was before Carling's paper was actually done, showing that we were missing a lot of services within the room. One of the other issues from the poster that I showed here from Shea is a lot of times our EBS staff are scared to use the, even the hospital disinfectant around the patient um, because, you know, they know they have to put their gloves on to use a product. Well, that can't be good near the patient because they don't have gloves on. So I think the second step clean was done in many cases to accommodate poor basic practices that we had. Now, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people to argue with me, and obviously doing two cleans is going to reduce, remove more stuff that's in the room. I don't care, you know, you're doing it twice. You should get a better result from it or hit the surfaces that were missed primarily. Um, this is one of the issues that I personally speak of around ultraviolet disinfection of the room. I can understand it being used in the high soiled area of, say, a washroom and a patient known to have clostridium difficile. But if you've done a really good job of cleaning, there really shouldn't be a lot of stuff left in the room. Um, so I think it gets back to really checking your basic cleaning practices. And there's some very interesting studies out there where even with enhanced cleaning, they couldn't achieve a really good cleaning in the room until trained auditors that were IPs went in and did the room top to bottom and made sure it was done. And the factor involved with that is the amount of time our EBS staff have. So I wonder, and I postulate here just brainstorming it out, if the time that it takes to do the room twice was given to the housekeeper to do the room the first time, would we see better pain? Interesting. Thank you, Jim. The next question is, what are your thoughts on double gloving while providing care for incontinent patients and then removing those once that task is complete? We know that the ideal is to remove gloves and wash hands, but it often doesn't happen for many reasons. Yeah, I used to preach that if I knew my staff, and again, I'm a lab technologist, I need to point that out again here, the last incontinent person I changed was my daughter when she was approximately a year old, um, and I appreciate the difficulty of doing this. I used to talk to my nursing staff saying, would it not make sense to have two pairs of gloves on, uh, to do the really dirty work first, change to the, or take off that layer of gloves, do what you need to do with the second gloves, take that off, sanitize your hands. But I have seen papers that, that show that there is contamination through the gloves. Many times staff will contaminate the underlying pair of gloves while removing the over pair of gloves. So it just leads to problems that way also. So I'm a little torn on it. I think a lot of that in terms of using double gloves is technique dependent. Now, having done autopsies, we wore two pair of gloves in the um, morgue because we were no, we were going to be exposed to blood and numerous other body fluids for long periods of time, anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. And I know invariably when I took off my outer layer of gloves, I had gloves on the inner layer. Uh, but that was a lot of times due to the prolonged use of the gloves, tearing it on the equipment and the actual cadaver that we were working on. And it just gave me good evidence of why I had two pairs of gloves on. And let me tell you, I washed my hands for a lot more than just 15 seconds after I took off that inner side. It was probably much closer to a minute um, and part of that was just a general ick factor of what I was doing. So I'm a little torn in the double gloves. I think we need to have um, some well-controlled studies to show if that might be something to help limit the spread within the patient's room. My concern is if some feces get through the first pair of gloves, we peel that off, and the second pair of gloves are actually contaminated, our staff might be prone to soiling the environment a little bit. So I'm a little equivocal on this, as you can tell. That's okay. Thank you, Jim. We have uh, time for one more short question. Um, and that question for you, Jim, is how long is the wet time of the IHP product? The product that was being used in the study was a one minute contact time. Perfect. On that note, unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to again thank Jim for his excellent presentation and for all of our audience members for participating today. I also want to remind everyone that you will receive an email within about a week following this webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. We look forward to having everyone join us for future webinars, and that concludes today's program. Have a wonderful afternoon.